in some ways, this, you know, you, you, the insulin is setting in and everyone's going to get drowsy. The, this is somewhat old-fashioned medicine. Um, a lot of this is, you know, it's you treat the pattern, you, you, you take a clinical history. Um, a lot of the uh, definitions for migraines are, are, are human-made criteria. They're written by learned, learned committees. There is some science and there are some new medicines. Um, the, the issue with the migraines that cause vertigo, and there's a couple of them, um, that mo but most of the research on new treatments is over on the other side in conventional migraine, migraine uh, with aura, chronic migraine, and there's not an awful lot uh, of, of uh, research on treatments for you know, migraines that cause vertigo because it's a smaller market share and there's just a lot more money on the other side of the street. Um, so that's my, you know, uh, working neurologist thoughts of vestibular migraine. I see an awful lot of headaches, but I see an awful lot of other things. We, we're the ALS clinic and we see a lot of my, myasthenia and we see pretty much everything that walks in the door. Um, we have, we're part of the Swedish Neuroscience Institute and we are at four campuses. We are in Edmonds, Ballard, Issaquah, and here, Cherry Hill. Cherry Hill being sort of the mothership where all the subspecialty clinics are. So you don't have to send everything to me. So we have several people, and we actually have two people who did headache fellowships, um, and that, but I've seen an awful lot of headaches over the years. So we have four campuses. Those are the phone numbers. And if you wish to send people to us, please send them to us. Um, if you look at them at a, uh, an article on migraines, you'll often see something like this. And um, what, what happens is CSD, cortical spreading depression, is what happens. And we don't, we don't know quite how that happens in people. It, it comes on spontaneously in some people. Some people are triggered. Uh, if you take a, a lab, uh, a, a lab rat or a rabbit and you can hit it with a spoon and you can get cortical spreading depression. But what happens is this. Next, same slide. Um, cortical spreading depression sometimes happens and this is the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, the fifth cranial nerve, which is, a, which is mainly a sensory nerve. And cortical spreading depression happens and those afferents, uh, at, when that happens, those afferent nerves dump things in there. There's potassium, C CGRP, nitrous oxide, substance P, and that then causes sterile, infl sterile inflammation, which then sends an afferent signal, because you know, those, those nerves just dump something in there, and then they send an afferent signal back up through the trigeminal nerve into the brainstem, and then sends it up north through the thalamus up to the cortex, which causes pain, but then it reflexes through the, the, uh, through the brainstem out to the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion, which then sends um, things all the way out to the meninges, which continues the cycle and continues to drop potassium, nitrous oxide, CGRP. And I wrote CGRP in there. I don't, are you familiar with CGRP? Anyone heard of that one? Calcitonin gene-related peptide. It'll come up on a further slide. Calcitonin gene-related peptide is, a, I believe, a 37 amino acid protein in you that has a role in generating migraines. And the new treatment for this is, um, the new treatment for this, uh, there's about three monoclonal antibodies that came out about six months ago. And none of them were studied for vestibular migraine, by the way. But, so a short, a short uh, cartoon of mine is, again, cortical spreading depression happens. It, it, it dumps things near the meninges and the arteries that supply the meninges. It sends a uh, signal back through the uh, afferent pathway. Um, it sends it, then it sends it north to the brain, and then it sends it through the SPG, sphenopalatine ganglion, which also is called the pterygopalatine ganglion because everything has to have two names and then it keeps sense sending the cycle out there. So that's kind of what you'll see. Well, I don't know if anyone remembers a long time ago, Group Health, which is now Kaiser, had a, com a, um, a commercial which they were advertising the wonderfulness of their electronic medical records. And they said, have you checked for cortical spreading depression? And I looked at that and I said, you know, did I miss a memo? I mean. 
there's not really a test for cortical spreading depression unless you're in a significant research lab. And, and, and our friends at Group Health are wonderful doctors, but they're probably not you know, doing you know, research studies uh, in functional MRI scanners. So I like to keep it simple. Headaches are defined by the pattern, and you treat the pattern. If you get one headache every two years, you can take anything you like. If you get 28 headaches a month, you need to do something different. So there are three things you can do with a pattern. If something makes it worse, don't do it. I mean, if every time you eat red wine, stop eating red wine. Bring us all our red wine and we'll take care of it. Bring us all your chocolate, we'll take care of it. You can treat the acute event. And if something is too frequent, you can give something to prevent the event. As a thought, if you're, now we don't really have a lot of acute treatments, specific acute treatments for vestibular migraine. We, we do have triptans for conventional migraines. If you can control the pattern with, say, th three doses of sumatriptan a month, then I don't need to add something. But we kind of ask people, is it worth adding a medicine to your life every day to prevent these events? And if they can control it with an individual agent episodically, then we're okay. If not, we try something else. Um, there are FDA approved treatments. These are the list of the FDA approved treatments. Topiramate, valproic acid, propranolol, timolol, onabotulinum toxin A, which is only approved for chronic migraine, which is defined as 15 headache days a month for three months in a row, and eight of the 15 per month have to meet IHS criteria for, for migraine. And then the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, which we'll get to later, but you're probably seeing ads for some of these. They have commercials. And then acute treatment, the, the triptans, which also treat cluster dihydroergotamines and the NSAIDs. There are a number of off-label treatments, um, tricyclics, SSNRIs, such as venlafaxine, lamotrigine, verapamil, and most of the other anticonvulsants get tried at some point. But these are all technically off-label, though they're often used. Um, the tricyclics went, um, you know, became cheap a long time ago, so nobody was going to, you know, bother to invest the money to get them approved for the, for the FDA. The, now, this is kind of, this is getting into how we define these, these things. The International Headache Society writes the International Classification of Headache Disorders, version three, which you can download uh, you know, for free and put in a binder, which I did. Um, and that is the kind of the rule book for how you define these conditions. Now, you, you can try and treat these, even if it doesn't completely meet all the conditions, but it's kind of like the DSM. This is how you define paranoid schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and things like this. So that is the definition for this. So briefly, we'll go over, they break it into primary headaches and secondary headaches, and then down here is the appendix. Primary headaches are migraine, tension, trigeminal autonomic cephalogists, such as cluster, Secondary headaches are things such as due to trauma and concussion. If you look at the primary headaches, uh, breaking it into migraines, there's a number of migraines. Migraine without aura, with aura, migraine with brainstem aura that was previously called basilar migraine, hemiplegic migraine, chronic migraine, the secondary headaches, and then way here at the bottom, in the appendix, A16.6, is vestibular migraine. So it's kind of the you know, poor stepchild of the headache disorders. Um, so things that are studied well, things that are not studied well. Um, there's simply, well, there's a fair amount, of, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, have a larger market share for things with migraine with aura, migraine without aura, and chronic migraine, so they have done large studies on this. They've done you know, few, if any, studies on hemiplegic migraine, migraine with brain stemora, and vestibular migraine. So we, we have a lot of data on the top and not as much data on the bottom. 
And you know, we like to have data, but you know, doctors, you know, they, they take what comes in and we do the best we can with them, but it would be nice if we had a bit more data. So we'll discuss a couple of the conventional migraines. Migraine with aura, at least two attacks. If you only have one attack, you're not yet a migraine sufferer. You have to have two. And you have to have at least um, one or more fully reversible aura symptom, which is visual, sensory, speech. It's usually visual, sometimes sensory, but it can be speech and language. Um, if it's hemiparesis, um, then it's, then it's hemi hemiparetic migraine. You have to have two of the four. The aura has to last for five to 60 minutes. Now, auras last five to 60 minutes. At least one aura is unilateral. At least one aura spreads gradually over five minutes. And the aura is accompanied or followed by headache. But you have to meet two of those four. So you don't have to have a headache, but you have to meet two of those four. Migraine without aura has to have two of the four. Pulsatile quality, unilateral location, moderate to severe pain, worse by physical activity. We usually ask if it gets worse walking up and down stairs. And during a headache, at least one of, one of the following, nausea or vomiting, and photophobia and phonophobia. If you only have photophobia and not phonophobia, you don't meet criteria. I know it's, 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 that's the way it's written. So, which gets us to the two that cause vertigo in migraines. Migraine with brainstem aura, priorly basilar migraine, and vestibular migraine. So now this is a slightly, this is a slightly busy slide. But uh, generally with migraine with brainstem aura, the vertigo is in the aura. It's in the, f the five to 60 minute aura phase. And you can have a number of other things with that. You can have dysarthria, vertigo, tinnitus, decreased level of consciousness, uh, double vision, ataxia. These are all brainstem functions. That's why they call it brainstem with aura. And um, at least you know, two of the four following, you know, and these are kind of similar to the earlier migraine with aura, you know, over, you know, spreads over five minutes, five to 60 minutes. Uh, at least one aura, aura symptom is unilateral and, and followed by a headache. And then, you know, if you see one of these things, though, you don't just jump to migraine with brainstem aura. You're going to, you're going to rule out TIA. You're going to look, think if it's a TIA. Is it a stroke? Was it something else? Because for some degree, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't want to you know, miss a seizure. You don't want to miss a TIA. You don't want to miss somebody who's got a 99% carotid stenosis, because that's bad. So anyway, the, um, now vestibular migraine um, is a little bit different. Um, you, have to, um, you have to have a history of migraine with or without aura. Technically, you have to have a history of migraine with or without aura to meet that criteria. And the interesting thing about the vestibular symptoms is it's not just the aura. This can go from five minutes to 72 hours. That's really a big you know, five minutes to three days. That's, that's, that's a, lot of, uh, a lot of leeway. Um, but then it you know, meets some of the other criteria for migraine, unilateral location, pulsable quality, you know, migraine or, or severe intensity, aggravated by physical activity, the usual th feelings for migraines. So you don't have to have, um, at least half of the episodes have to have at least one of the following three migraine features. So you don't, so you can have vertigo, and just have vertigo for 18 to 18 hours or so, and not have any of the other features. But if you follow the pattern, you have to have some of these, at least per, you know, per the criteria, have, have to have some of these migraine features per this criteria. Now, you know, there's, it's a little hard to know exactly because, because, you know, it's hard to kind of measure this. There's not a biomarker for this or something. So, you know, people have various thoughts as to how often this happens. You know, some literature suggests that 1% of the population suffers from vertigo-related dizziness with migraine. Uh, in the Baronet and IHS societies, uh, 
The vestibular migraine accounts for 7% of patients in a dizziness clinic and 9% of patients in a headache clinic. So that's, a, pre, that's a, a somewhat selection bias, but those are people with dizziness and headaches. So it, it does show up, but it's not the majority of what wanders in. The, now, this is, this is a problem with the acute treatment of hemiplegic migraine, vestibular migraine, migraine of brain stem aura. The use of triptans um, is vexing. Uh, no, no direct safety data exists as basilar artery migraine and hemiplegic migraine, which also includes, you know, and they haven't studied vestibular migraine either, have been largely excluded from the triptan studies. And triptans have been, you know, I think they came out um, uh, in the late 1990s, and they're about 70% effective if you can find the right one. There are some retrospective data, you know, 67 people with migraine brain stemora, 40 treated with triptans, 13 people with hemiplegic migraine, five treated with triptans, no reports of stroke, but that's a retrospective observative study. On one triptan study for um, vestibular migraine, uh, 10 patients, 17 attacks, 38% for triptan, 22% for placebo, nobody got a stroke, but again, that's 10 patients. So in general, most people, most people would recommend not using triptans for vestibular migraine, migraine with brain stem aura, or hemiplegic migraine. So, so we emphasize um, you know, uh, so we generally emphasize you know, more conventional things like promethazine, meclizine, ondansetron, the benzodiazepines, uh, which, are kind, which are not specific just to migraines, but this is what we use if we have somebody. Um, if, in an ER, it's not uncommon if someone's not driving themselves home, we often give someone a benzodiazepine because it will get them uh, out the door with some efficiency. In terms of prevention, we don't have a tremendous amount of data on prevention. We have uh, one, uh, 75 patients randomized to venlafaxine, flunerazine, and valproate. Um, no placebo, three months. It was measured by the dizziness handicap inventory. Venlafaxine and valproate reduced vertigo attacks. Venlafaxine and flunerazine were more effective for vertigo severity. Now, the thing is that as you come into this, um, some of these medicines that are not usually used in conventional migraines, like venlafaxine, in the next couple slides, lamotrigine, uh, are often used a bit more for vestibular migraines as opposed to the more conventional uh, treatments that you use for conventional migraines. Uh, this was a recent study. This is, this is Alice in Wonderland, where objects feeling bigger, smaller, closer, further away, body feels bigger or smaller, out-of-body experiences, 17 patients, of which six were lost to follow up. But of those treated, three improved with topiramate, three improved with lamotrigine, one improved with venlafaxine, and four improved with tricyclics. Again, that's 17 patients. Other small studies, uh, valproate, um, 37 patients, three months, some benefit. Topiramate, 100 milligrams a day, 10 patients, nine months, some benefit. Lamotrigine, 50 milligrams twice a day, 19 patients, reduced vertigo, but not headaches of headache frequency, excuse me. So back to just a slide just to bring back the CGRPs. They haven't been studied yet in vestibular migraine, but they're, coming, they're becoming fairly common for people who see, have a lot of headaches. So the CGRPs are right there. They, that gets dumped by the, when the cortical spreading depression hits and the afferent nerves dump CGRP and all this other stuff. Those are monoclonal antibodies against either the CGRP receptor or the CGRP protein itself. And so just a thought on, we now have three, these are all generic names, uh, we have three, and what they do, um, it looks like an EpiPen, you inject it yourself once a month in your thigh, and 
Uh, it takes, sometimes it, hurt, it, it works in the first month, but you usually try to give it about three months. There's not a lot of side effects that we know of yet, but we have five months of experience with them. Uh, we do get constipation with some people, but you know, in three years, we'll have three, three more years of experience with all of this. The, um, they are approved for both episodic and chronic migraine. So we might eventually, as we get enough of these people out there, we might eventually get some data on whether it is improving vertigo. So some side effects to consider. Um, and I'll get, and this is, I'll get to what, how I use these in a moment. But valproic acid is a teratogen, causes weight gain. Topiramate, pregnancy class D, causes weight, uh, weight loss, kidney stones, dopiness. They call it nicknamed Dopamax. If you give it to a 75-year-old person, try to give them a very small dose because they might just kind of say, hmm? You know, they'll look a little bit like they're on cannabis. Uh, Lamotrigine is it's safe except it has a 5 to 8% risk of a rash and can become Stevens Johnson's. I've never given anyone Stevens Johnson's, and I've used it a lot for, for seizures, and, among, and it's also used for bipolar. There is a rare fetal reaction, rare fatal reaction, hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, which has uh, is is occurred about 30 times in the last 10 years. But what you do with lamotrigine is you start very low. And you might want to send it to a neurologist if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but you start very low at 25 milligrams, and you, you watch it slowly. Venlafaxin is relatively safe, although it may interfere with other antidepressants. Verapamil may interfere with other blood pressure medicines. And the trick with verapamil is to use the short-acting one, TID. Don't use the long-acting one. The short-acting one seems to work better for headaches. If, it works, if the short-acting one works well for headaches, then you can go to the long-acting one. So my short approach to this, if, if the vertigo is in the aura, which means it's probably migraine with brainstem aura, I would start with verapamil. And I would use 40 milligrams three times a day and then go to 80 milligrams three times a day unless it wipes out their blood pressure, which it probably won't. Um, but if you, if, if you get better with that, that is a very good medicine for migraine and brain stemora. If there is obesity, diabetes, and no kidney stones, I would try topiramate because it will help with weight loss. Um, and I usually start at 50 milligrams twice a day. And if you're really worried, you can start at 50 milligrams once a day and then go to 50 milligrams twice a day. The most, for epilepsy, we go to 200 milligrams twice a day. For that, I usually, for headaches, I usually go to 100 milligrams twice a day and probably not much higher. For the venlafaxin, 37.5 milligrams once a day, up to 75, possibly up to 150 a day. It's probably not a good medicine if, you have, if, you're, if you're worried about bipolar. If not obese and no risk of pregnancy, Depakote 500 milligrams a day up to 500 milligrams twice a day uh, is not very sedating, but it's a teratogen, 9% risk of spina bifida. Um, if there is a chance of pregnancy, and then this comes up, you know, um, I, I always ask if they're wanting to thinking about risking a pregnancy or planning a pregnancy, I always ask, um, I would probably just try not to do any harm, in which case I would usually just start with magnesium. And the over-the-counter magnesiums, mag oxide, there's 400 milligrams, and elemental magnesiums, 300 milligrams. Um, unless they're prone to loose stools, I usually just you know, give them 400 milligrams twice a day and see how that makes them feel. And that's it. Questions? sinus pain, uh, could be uh, a migraine patient, what would be something that a, an otolaryngologist could do a trial? I, I've seen like people load up with magnesium, I've seen supplements. Um. Yeah, I would, pro well, it depends what you feel safe doing. I would probably, if, you know, magnesium is awfully, is awfully safe. Um, if you were thinking it was, a, it was a vestibular related migraine, I would probably try either verapamil or possibly venlafaxin, but you know you want to be sure that you don't have bipolar disorder or something like this. The, the doctor doesn't, or the patient doesn't. <laughs> the the doctor's bipolar, or the patient's bipolar. Um, well, most yeah. Well, most of us, well, neurologists, you know, we're all, 
we're all a little <laughs> bit off. But yeah, uh, if because um, yeah, you, you can sometimes with some of the SSRIs, uh, you, you know, I get a little worried about bipolar disorder because some of the SSRIs can make them worse. But um, so I just kind of you know you know think about that. But I usually would yeah. But I, you're usually pretty safe if you if you're pretty clear that they don't have an obvious psychiatric disorder. Um, and I would often try either magnesium, verapamil, benlafax, and lamotrigine I use a lot of, but it's, you need to follow it. You need to be, be very careful about it. So I think the moral of the story is you get a great partnership with a really smart neurologist that you can send them to, because these are pretty tough. Um, you know, it's very interesting that there's a, a working diagnosis going on right now, a working thought process in the Prosper Meniere Society, talking about migraine, uh, or Meniere's actually, a variant of Meniere's actually being migraine of the spiral lamina of the inner ear. And there's so much overlap, you can get fluctuation in the hearing. And I think it's very important to understand the criteria for migraine, and it's very important to understand the criteria for Meniere's syndrome. And Meniere's syndrome is probably the most common diagnosis that comes out of any emergency room that gets meclizine, which doesn't treat Meniere's in the first place, of anything that makes people dizzy. So I think it's important to understand what those are. When I, when I see patients with migraine now, or Meniere's, I've actually loaded down these uh, criteria on a, on a template and I put it under the discussion of the patient care so the patient, the, when the doctor gets it back, they can actually see why I made the diagnosis. Lisa? Did you get that, Eric? I didn't quite, I didn't quite. So, so the difference between vertigo with aura versus migraine. Well, um, well, vertigo, you know, vertigo is a symptom, and if it if it occurs in an aura, if you decide that it's in an aura, you know, if it goes over, if it advances over, say, five minutes, if it ends, if it ends in sixty in less than sixty minutes, and if it's followed by other migraine-related features, if the vertigo is in the aura, then I would probably treat it as migraine as migraine with brainstem aura, you know, with verapamil. But you know, you can. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, and, and everyone, everyone who's practiced medicine knows that there's overlap, and you kind of reach for the toolbox that you have. So, you know, it's not un it would not be unreasonable to try lamotrigine. It would not be unreasonable to try venlafaxine. It would not be unreasonable to try Depakote or, to or topiramate. Um, but, uh, but if it's if it's over in the if it's really in the migraine phase, if it's like you know, you know, several hours long, then it's probably a vestibular migraine and you'd, and you'd probably stay a little bit away from the verapamil and you might go a little bit more towards the topiramate, valproic acid, lamotrigine. But, you know, you reach for the toolbox you have. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, these are kind of human-made criteria. So sometimes that one will work with this and that one will work with that. So I think from the, uh, from the actual clinical side, from the otology side, um, all of these patients, we send them for a nutrition consult, and we worked with the nutritionists about a two gram sodium per day migraine trigger avoidance diet. So they get instructions for about an hour about migraine triggers. They have them keep a journal, and they spend about an hour with them, which is probably the biggest thing. So they all go on that. Uh, we give them clonopin, 0.5 milligrams, to take every six hours. And I have them take that, take a dose on a Saturday when they got nothing going on to see if it amps them up or puts them to sleep so they don't take their first clonopin when they're on I-5 having a vertigo episode. <laughs> and that actually covers migraine and Meniere's. And then it's really a series of trial and error. And I set, I set people up when I see the America. I'm not sure what you do, but I tell them, I say, you know, first of all, I acknowledge you have a problem. And I'll even tell them flat out, you know, I, I really don't think you're crazy. I think you have a problem. And then they giggle and you validated them and tell them it's going to be a process to get this figured out. And I'll say, and Eric can probably testify to this, 85% of our patients just get better on diet alone. And, uh, and it's very powerful. Morgan Kriz is uh, a physical therapist that we stole from Swedish up at our practice in, in Edmonds. And if you could just give us like maybe two minutes on what you do, and physical therapy is actually playing a bigger role. And if you could explain why, Morgan. And Morgan, by the way, um, is the proud mother of her first baby that's only how many weeks old? Two weeks old and she's, she's wanted to come anyway because all women are tough and dudes are weenies. Um. Yeah, so my name is Morgan. I'm a vestibular physical therapist. Um, so I work closely with Dr. Backus and all the ENTs up at Puget Sound, <coughs> excuse me, Puget Sound, your nose and throat. Um, so my background being a vestibular physical therapist is always to screen if there is any 
peripheral limitations. Um, if vertigo is the patient's main complaint, just making sure that there is no uncompensated vestibular weakness. Um, and we have exercises for gaze stabilization, trying to uh, enhance someone's somatosensory or physical feedback um, if there is an uncompensated vestibular weakness. And then I find a lot of people have the visual dominant um, kind of uh, use their vision throughout the day and are, have poor postural awareness, so we try to focus on that. And then being able to spend significant amount of time helping people go through a diary or a trigger diary and trying to manage that on their own. I think that's the biggest um, contribution. So. How about the neck effort working with neck regulation? Yeah, so um, kind of going back to the whole body awareness, um, posture can play a big role. So if, uh, if the cervical spine has any uh, hypomobility or hypermobility, uh, musculoskeletal limitations, always try and address those. Um, if there is a cervicogenic component, um, someone had a history of whiplash or a concussion several years ago and now is getting these headaches, um, trying to uh, come in and do a little bit of hands-on or uh, manual therapy to loosen up muscles, give them more core strength, and, uh, and trying to limit the um, cervical contributions of when someone turns their head, they get a little dizzy. It's not from the inner ear necessarily, it's from the neck afferents, so. What was your dosing on the um, I give clonopin 0 0.5 milligrams every six hours. And I tell them, particularly if they have nausea and vomiting, that's where meclizine's helpful and motion sickness, and it doesn't really put a lot of people to sleep. But I tell them to take it under their tongue like a nitro tablet and let it dissolve. Because if you swallow it and you chuck it out with vomit, you're not going to get any medication. So to, to keep ourselves on schedule, first of all, thank you, Eric. That was a great, uh, great conversation.